Welcome, welcome everybody to the Agora sessions. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this was this was not a video like a regular video. This is not a regular song as well. Um, this is a homemade video actually by our guest speaker for today with the audio uh, from the song Pangea from Professor Kaleek. Or I don't know. I'm sorry, Kaleek. <laughs> what is that name? Either way. Uh, but yeah, you guys know my name is Kike uh, and I, alongside Sophie. Hello. Who is actually back from her so much needed and well deserved holidays, uh, will be yeah. your hosts today. Um, we welcome Matty as well, who is going to be our tech master in the end. Okay, welcome everyone. Nice to be back. So let me share how the structure for this session is going to be. You are going to be muted as always, but feel free to unmute yourselves if you have any questions or comments to add or share with our guest speaker. And as usual, you have the chat open, so feel free to add any comments or you can use the Q&A section. So let's go to the important things. Let me introduce you for the very first time to Yanis Farco. He's a business development representative. He's been with us since June this year. He's the kind of meditation guy. Yanis would be the guy that says, you see a mountain, I see something I can climb. Yeah, he's crazy. He's based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Yanis, thanks a lot for joining us today and the mic is all yours. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Kike. Well, guys, I mean, thanks for, for the space. Uh, thanks for giving me the Agora session for me to tell a little bit about, well, the video that you guys saw. I went to the Everest Base Camp. I did uh, the Everest Base Camp and the three passes hiking. And it will be a pleasure to share a bit with you guys about it, how it went, learnings. And as Sophie said, please feel free to ask, to join me, to give any considerations that you have. This is much more of a talk instead of me just uh, giving a whole presentation. So it will be a pleasure to share a bit with you guys about me and the trip and everything. So Kike, please, I'm going to have to be the, <laughs> the guy who says. Yeah, yeah. You, you just like... move me as, as much as you want, right? No worries. Awesome, man. So, yeah, guys, I would like to start sharing with you guys. I mean, when I decided to go to the Everest uh, base camp and to do the three passes, the most common question I got was, why? Why are you doing it? Like, really, you're going to spend like 20 days in the mountain? Is it going to be cold? You're going to be walking? Where does, does this come from? So it all begins uh, with a little, actually, before this picture, this is a picture of me and my father hugging out at Aconcagua. Uh, in Chile, Argentina, it, it depends on which side you climb. But since I was a really, really small kid, like for five, six years, uh, my father would say to me that when I got to 15, he would bring me to climb uh, Aconcagua with him. And we always had like a really close relationship, but it was all almost always through sports. Like he was a tennis player. I also did play a lot of tennis. Uh, in my childhood and we did had this connection but we didn't always like were able to share about personal struggles about things uh like deeper things in life is not the guy who shares a lot and me neither so this was a really important trip like regarding my relationship with myself and with my father and once i got a grasp of what it is to be in a mountain and to climb and doing it with someone you love, it was amazing for me. Just the experience of being in a place where you don't have connection with anyone, you don't have Wi-Fi, you don't have cell phone. The only two things that you need to pay attention is to walk and to breathe. It was amazing. And the base camp was something that my father, would, like throughout his whole life, he wanted, really wanted to do. Uh, and we tried to do in 2015, but he is in 2015, he was like 65, 64, he's 70 now, 71. And he couldn't go because he had a uh, high blood pressure. And this was like a bitter taste for me and him. But I decided like, I, I want to go through with this. I want to do it by myself. I want to have this experience. 
and I partnered up with my best friend. Uh, you're gonna you saw the, him on the videos. You're gonna see him a little bit more in the pictures. Uh, Rafael Albanese, and we decided to go to the Everest Base Camp on 2018. I'm sharing the date because we only went on 2022. As you guys know, pandemics and everything, we decided to go 2018, 2019, pandemics heated. Uh, we couldn't go and we spent a lot of the time planning, which is part of the next thing I want to tell you guys. So please keep it. There you go. So now it's going. It's, it's basically time for us all to get ready because this thing is uh, is about to start. So, but first, we would like to know uh, everyone uh, what do you guys think about um, climbing. Do you think it's a crazy idea? Do you think this is something uh, you would do um, maybe in some moment of your life? Uh, you get uh, here in this screen, if you go down to the, to the bottom of the screen at your right, you'll have the Slido emoji uh, with um, a question that is, if you have ever thought in climbing a mountain, some of them will actually say that there's not even a chance to get nearby a mountain. Some of you will ask, uh, will ask Yanis, sorry, uh for some advice maybe yanis can convince you guys to go over there uh and maybe you guys want to go to the andes to the himalaya or to the big rocks in the us i don't know but hey vote here tell us what you think about it um at least me sophie i've been in the mountains thankfully once or twice in my life and i really love it uh, what I don't love it so much is when the snow actually melts. That's kind of, you know, it's like gross. Everything is really gross, brown over there, and I just, just don't like it. So I prefer like really, really hard winter or even in the summer where it's actually all pretty, you know, not green is not the correct answer, but it's over there. What do you, what do you think about it? Well, actually, I can go to the mountains in summer. Rather than winter, I don't like snow. Uh, but never climbing those mountains if Yanis likes to climb. No, that's not me, of course. No. Well, not prepared okay. at all for that one. Well, well, what I think is that basically most of the guys here actually are uh, more on Yanis' side instead of your side. Because with almost 20 votes, we had a 60% that says that, heck yeah. They would actually climb the mountain. So, Yanis, I think that the, the audience is already there for you, mate. So, it's all up to you now. That's awesome, guys. It is a really, really amazing experience. Uh, so, I would say that you should do it. And I want to tell a little bit of how I prepared myself. And I wanted to start with this uh, picture on the left. Yes, I'm the guy with the long hair. Okay, it's been a while ago. <laughs> But it is a picture that my sister shared uh, on her Instagram. And there's a, on the top, it's written at that when your brother needs to train to go to the Everest Base Camp and you need to go to the market, so one, help each other. And I was this guy. I was supposed to be this guy for six months. I was this guy for two years and a half because I had to postpone the travel. But I have like a backpack on the side of my door and I would go everywhere with it. I would walk to the market with my sister. I would go to, I don't know, walk here around the place that I live, uh, always trying to uh, get my body to be used to two main things. The first one was the weight of the backpack. I never, uh, I don't usually walk with the uh, with a 15 kilos backpack. So this is filled with uh, rice, beans, and weights, and books, or anything I could find to get around 15 kilos, and I would walk with it uh, all over the place. And the other thing was to get my body uh, used to the idea of like being in motion for five, six, or seven hours, because I was always a sport guy in my life, but I do like short and intense uh, amount of sports. Like I love to play volleyball. Play volleyball for an hour and a half is really intense. I love to run. If I run 10 kilometers, it's going to take me less than an hour. So my body was not used to be like in this kind of stress for five and six hours. So I would put a headphone and 
you could see me walking through the streets of Sao Paulo with a backpack like a crazy guy. And I did this throughout uh, mostly two years. And yeah, the picture on the right is me uh, getting my backpack ready. And this was a process that it took. I'm, I'm not the most organized person in the world. So I try to organize myself as, most, as, as, as much as I can. And my backpack was like, for a, a year, I had my backpack ready with almost everything I needed to bring. No, I didn't took my dog to the Everest, <laughs> even though I wish I could. But just like there's a lot of things you need to take in consideration while building your backpack. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a while. But kick it, please move forward. Uh, there's another thing I would like to share. I also took some time to go to all the mountains that I could here uh, in, in, well, south or of Brazil. So this is a picture of, uh, of Rafael, the friend that I, that I told you guys on Pico do Paraná, just to get the idea of climbing with a lot of weight and trying to get my body and mind around it just to have the idea of how it would be on the Everest. Uh, and yeah, please move, move forward, Kike. So this next slide is about a list I created with everything I should have on my backpack. Of course, there's a bunch of words in Portuguese. Probably you guys won't recognize most of it. But it's just two things that I would like to, to take from here. The first one, when I told Kike, he was really impressed. It's about the wipes, the, the lenses humidecido. I don't know if you guys uh, know, but... The thing that you, you use to clean like uh, babies or stuff, I, I spent like 21 days on the Everest doing this, this, this hiking. And it's not that you don't have showers. You do have them. But, but you will be at some minus 15, minus 20 degrees and there's no hot water. So wipes for the minimum hygiene. <laughs> you take showers with wipes. I did it. And I spent like 20 days like washing myself with wipes. This is something that is normal in this kind of, uh, of trips. Okay, guys. And so, the other so thing. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, sorry, Anis. Uh, I think that this, the, we have like two things to, to take into consideration here that are really, really important. Uh, the first of all, when you're planning to go to the Everest, you know, you, you, you I mean, all of us here in Athena will need to go by plane. So, Get a first stop in the free shop, get some perfume, and then put in your backpack before going to the travel because you guys are gonna need Expensive that. Expensive bath. Yeah, I mean, at least a liter or a liter and a half just of perfume. I mean, you're not gonna take some water, you need perfume. That's it. And the other one is that Yanis have said like two minutes ago that he's not an organized guy, but I need to cut in three. This big ass list that Yanis made, a not organized person with an enormous list of and, and a double check in everything. So, if Yanis, if you are not organized, what's up with the rest of us? I mean, we are screwed. When you are not organized, Kike, you have to organize yourself more than most of the people. So, uh, I'm the guy that if I'm gonna sleep somewhere else, if I'm gonna have a sleepover, I'm gonna like forget everything everything I, I i'm this kind of guy so i try to be as organized as i can because i wouldn't like be happy if in the middle of the mountain i discovered that i'm missing like something important and there's a lot of important things like the sleep bag you need to have one so you don't like don't freeze yourself and th there's something here that i would never thought about it and it was something that really made a difference on the trip that was the isotonic founder that is something that you can buy that you put in your water that it it triples the the amount of hydration that you are getting from for a glass of water so if you drink a glass with this isotonic powder it will be the same of drinking three glasses your body is going to absorb more of it and this is something really important when you're climbing on high, high altitudes because the acclimatization process is something that can really get to you if you don't want climatize well enough, like and by acclimatize, what do I mean? Our body it, it doesn't react really well if you go from three thousand meters to four thousand meters, and then in another day you just wake up and go to four thousand to five thousand meters. So what you have to do is you go from three thousand to three thousand and a half, 
and then you come back, sleep at 3,000 again, you go to 4,000, and then you sleep at 3,8, and then you keep climbing. This is what we call a climatization process, and being really hydrated helps a lot with it, and you, you can feel, if you do feel bad, you can feel nauseous, you can feel sick, and, well, the, the, the middle of Everest is not the best place to feel this way, so hydration is something really, really important. Yeah, uh, move on, Kike, please, to the next slide. So with everything uh, set, ready to go, the first stop is the first thing you have to do to get there to the Himalayas is flying to Lukla. So if you go from Brazil, you will go from Brazil to Dubai, to Dubai to Kathmandu on Nepal, and to Kathmandu, you take a 30 minutes flight to Lukla. It's around the 22 hours trip. And if you move forward a uh, slide, Kike, please, there's a little bit about uh, landing in Lukla, about the Lukla airport. So the Tenzing Hillary airport is known as the most dangerous airport in the world just because you fly in a plane that is, it's a really bad plane, guys. There was like, there, my seat was glued with duct tape and it's a B motor, so you have like seven, eight uh, places most, and you fly in the middle of the mountains, so you can feel like any wind or any bad weather, it really gets to you. And the uh, the landing track is really small, so the pilot needs to really know what he's doing. And something that I really like to share is that when I came back, a lot of people asked me like, what what was the hardest part? What was the the thing that you feared the most while doing it? And for the ones that know me, just the, the, the thing that I hate the most in my whole life is airplane traveling. I hate it. I hate it. I, I've never uh, gave up on a trip because I do. But uh, if you travel with me, you're going to see a guy that is going to climb on a plane. And if it's a, an, hour, an hour, a two hour trip or a 20 hour trip, I'm going to sit, uh, sit on my seat. I'm going to hold the seat arms and I'm going to be like this throughout the whole flight, I don't breathe, I don't get up to go pee, I don't eat, nothing. And I, when I get there, I'm the guy who applauds it. Uh, Kike told me that in Argentina, you do the same here in Brazil, we do it, okay? When the plane lands, and I'm the guy that, that starts it. I'm like, when it lands, I'm like, okay, awesome job, man, I'm alive. <laughs> you know, you know, we, were, we were talking with Yanis about this. It came up to my mind, um, this image from the Pope, that kisses the ground every single time that he goes out of uh, of a plane. So I, I'm just imagining Yanis getting getting out of this plane in the middle of nowhere in Lukla and just kissing the earth. It doesn't matter if a ship was sitting in there like two minutes ago. He'll just kiss the earth, be really thankful that he's he's alive. And, and hey guys, if you're planning to go on a trip uh, with Yanis, uh, take some horse pills to give some good sleep to this guy because. He's actually gonna need it. I don't. I don't take pills. I don't like to sleep. I like, I like to pay attention and keep medit trying to meditate and keeping track of my mind. This is something that I, I I I was planning to share later, but I can do it now. The idea of fear for me it was always it is being afraid is important in the mountain because with the fear you get more aware of your surroundings, you get more aware uh, and you take things more in consideration, but the fear needs to be always a kind of a fuel. If you let it dominate you, I've been through this in an airplane. I had panic attacks in the middle of the airplane. And it's like, well, there was once I was coming back from, from Brasilia to Sao Paulo, and I broke it. I was like screaming in the middle of the plane, saying to my father that was with me, I was uh, uh, little, to say, please make it stop. Let, let, let me jump out of it. So... If you do let the, the fear uh, get grasp of, of you, man, you're done. So I don't take any kind of pills, Kike, just because I need to be like in charge of it, you know, even though I'm pretty scared, I need to be in charge of it. That's cool. And yeah, if you move to the next one, a, a thing that is really nice to share about the flight, guys, is that even though this was the plane and Rafael is sitting on the front seat, so he's on the first uh, seat there is in the plane. You can see the back is really small. But the good thing about it is that you can see the, the Himalaya mountain chain, and it's amazing, guys. 
when I went to uh, La Cordillera de los Andes uh, in, in, in Argentina slash Chile. <laughs> uh, in Argentina, yes. Okay. okay, you, can okay. <laughs> uh, you can see like uh, if you go to a winery, a Fede, it's Fede here. If you go to Mendoza, drink wine with Fede, you're going to sit on a winery and you're going to see the Cordillera and it's amazing. You have like 10, 15, maybe 20 mountains that are really high and it's really amazing. When I started seeing the Cordillera on, on the plane, it's insane, guys. You have like 60 mountains that are above 5,000 meters. It's the, the size of it. It's insane. So this is the really good part of having this plane trip is that you can see the Himalaya from the top and it's an amazing, amazing, amazing view. And please, Kike, move to the, to the next one. Okay, so let me take a time here in the map just so you guys understand a little bit of what I did. Uh, from landing on Lukla, the first trek that you do is to Nancha Bazaar. You're going to walk uh, an eight, nine hours walk to Nancha Bazaar. You can stop in the middle if you want. We decided not to. And from Nancha Bazaar, you have three paths that you can do. You can go straight to the Everest Base Camp. It's not on the map, but there is a path that you go from Nancha Bazaar to the number 10, Gorakship. And then from Gorakship, you go to the Everest Base Camp. Or you could do the three passes through the left or through the right. So if you go to the left, you're going to go to Renjola first, Renjola Pass, Chola Pass, Base Camp, and then Kongmala Pass. If you go through the right side, it's the opposite way, Kongmala first, and then you go to the Base Camp. And we were... We spent two years and a half, guys, preparing to do the path on the left. But the great thing for me about this trip, one of the best things, actually, is that we decided to go without a guide. We decided to not hire a Sherpa, not hire anyone to take our backpacks, or not to have anyone to decide what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. So the whole trip, it was supposed to go from Nancha Bazar to Lungde, and then doing the Range of La Pass. And this was how things were supposed to be. When we arrived on Nancha Bazar, and you can go to the next slide, Kike, just so you guys uh, get a grasp for what is the Nancha Bazar. It's the biggest city in the Himalayas mountain. That's the, the, the picture of the city. Uh, once we got there, the thing was that in these two years of pandemic, of COVID, the park, the national park has been closed. So there were not, no tourists, not anyone doing the, the trails, not uh, a single lodge that was open or anything like that. And when I decided to go with Rafael, it was like a pre-season. We went like a month before people would really start going. So when we got to Nancho Bazaar, we made some friendships. And a Sherpa there told us, like, guys, I don't know if you're going to find anyone in, 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 in Lungde. Uh, probably it's going to be like, a desert and you, you're not going to have like a place to sleep. You're going to have not, not going to have a place to settle down. This is something important to tell you guys in this trip. You don't bring tents. You sleep always in a lodge. There are these really small houses with really, really thin wood. Uh, to the ceiling. <laughs> nice, nice uh, dock. <laughs> and a really uh, thin um, wood, um, you know, uh, a wall and everything so you sleep always on this kind of of lodges and once we got there the guy told us so you can do the left the path on the left uh we had a map we set it down we had also a garmin watch with gps and everything and we had to replan the whole trip and decided like what are the places we're going to stop how we're going to do this to the right side and this is this is for me is, is amazing like having the opportunity of figuring out by ourselves what we're going to do while making friendships, while learning with the guys about the mountains and not like just a guy who gets there and say, okay, okay, we're going to not go to the left, we're going to go to the right because this is how it is and, and, and go. So this was really something uh, really, really nice. We decided to go to the right side and it was really fun because when I came back, we didn't have like Wi-Fi connections or cell phone or anything. So... At this point, my whole family and my fiance that was at, at my, my house, she was like, every day she would woke up and see where I was. And I tried to get in, in, in the connection, in the energy connection with me. And she did this 
it worked out for the first few days and then it was like the complete opposite. She, she, she thought I was on a place and I was like on the other side of the mountain and it went like this to the rest of the trip. So yeah, Kike, please uh, move move on. Yeah, yeah. something that, that I actually want to wanna comment on this, um, this part that you said, uh, Yanis, about um, the tent. I mean, this is like a really formal, and what you've just said about the lodge, it's a really formal and political way of saying that you were actually doing glamping. It's okay. You, you can say <laughs> that you were doing glamping. Nobody will actually be heard if you if you say that you will go to the Himalaya and do glamping. It's okay. I mean, it's you can fine. admit it. <laughs> but it makes a huge difference to have like a bed, to have a place to sleep, and also to have food. Because when you sleep on a lodge there on the on the cities, you have like you pay for it, of course, but you have to, you have people cooking for you. And this is amazing because if you have, if the trip is about like bringing a tent and sleeping on it, you're going to have to bring like all your food. You're going to have to bring things to cook your food. So from 15 uh, kilos of a backpack, it would go to like 30 kilos just because you have to bring all that stuff. So it is, it makes really, really easier uh, in that, in that way. That's it. So you better yeah. go to the gym, guys. You already know. Okay, I, so uh, taking no, sorry, just, yeah. just no, this is happened because you said about going to the gym, and this is something nice to share as well. Uh, just taking in consideration, I since we had the pandemic and everything, when I went to the Everest, I wasn't the best possible physical like I've ever been in my life. I've like I played tennis in in the some in the uh, São Paulo Federation we call pa Paulista Federação Paulista. And I was to practice like five hours, six hours a day. And I wasn't in a physical level that I was when I went to Everest. But one thing you can prepare is the amount of oxygen that you're going to have and that you have on high places. Here in Sao Paulo, we are basically at sea level. Uh, in Brazil, we don't have like as many mountains. So when we got there on, on Lukla and going to Nancha Bazar, you are around 2,500 to 3,500 meters. And the first thing we did when we left the plane was climbing. It's like a 30 steps staircase. And at the end of it, we were completely gassed out. Completely gassed out because we were like, okay, we are like really thin, really athletic, and we're going to climb this up. And we did it really fast. And at the end of it, we were like, okay, this is not how we're going to go. We're going to really have to take in consideration like walking really slow. And this for me is the greatest thing about being in a mountain. You have to really breathe every step that you take, pay a lot of attention on your breathing, and there's nothing else that you have to pay attention on. So it is a meditation practice. It, it, it really is. If you guys uh, like to meditate, you could do it walking on a mountain, and it's amazing the, the sense of presence and mindfulness that you get while doing it. That's it. Nice. Nice. So, guys, moving on a little bit. So now it's a little trivia time. So you can you can see over there. You got three mountains, and what you need, you guys need to do is go to the Slido again, right here in the bottom at your right, um, and guess which one of these three mountains belongs to the Himalaya. Is it maybe mountain wine? One? No, wine? No. I mean, you, Yanis, you talk about wine and Mendoza, and I just <laughs> always I thinking myself. about wine, Tika. Yes, we we need to do another agora with wine tasting. I think, huh? We, there's a lot of guys new here, and they they need mm. to to learn some things about. There you go. We got another wine guy over there. Thanks, man. <laughs> okay, but going back to the mountain, we'll leave the wine for other time. Guys, which one of these do you think it's the Himalaya? Remember, there's a lot of mountains. Himalaya, it's a big chain of mountains uh, in which you can find the Everest as well. Uh, but you got other chains really, really important around the world as the Cordillera de los Andes in Argentina and Chile. <laughs> and you got another really important, uh, important chain in the US as well. So. Uh, and Ecuador and Peru. There you go. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, most of you uh, have voted that the mountain number one belongs uh, to the Himalaya. And, guys, you got that right. 
Mountain number one belongs to Himalaya. Really, really good. Well done, everyone. Um, Yanis, you want to tell the story about uh, these three pictures a little bit? Yeah, just the, the first one is actually when you go, when you get to Nanshe, there's the acclimatization uh, hiking that you do to a place that is called the Everest View Hotel. And this is uh, us doing this, this this hiking. So you could actually see the Everest for the first time when you cross this, when you make the curve that we are looking to on the first picture. The second one is Salkantai that I did on, on the beginning of this of this year uh, on Peru. Awesome, awesome trail as well. Amazing hiking. You can go all the way to Salkantai. You do a pass there and then you go all the way to Machu Picchu. And the third one is a picture I took when I was 15 on Aconcagua, just climbing. This is the south face of Aconcagua. There's a thing about Aconcagua that you can climb through two different paths. You have the north face and the south face. If you do the south face, I don't know how it is nowadays, but when I went, it was like the hardest climbing uh, challenge in the world. You have like a huge fatality rate. It's like a huge wall of ice that you have to climb. I did the other way, of course, but yeah. <laughs> so this is this is really encouraging everyone to to do mountain climbing, Yanis. Thank you. You're doing. Don't do. do I'm not. Do. Don't do the south face of 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 Aconcagua, guys. Don't do it. <laughs> do do through the north face. <laughs> there you go. So. After getting uh, to Nanshe, we started going our way into Shukungi. Uh, Shukung is a place that you can climb a mountain of uh, Shukung Ri. And after the Shukung uh, Ri mountain, you got to do your first pass for us. It was the Kongma Pass. Uh, the idea of doing a pass, it's really, it was really hard for, like, just in physical. And the idea of breathing above 5,000 meters, what it was hard to do it um 10 to 9 hours trek it was not as hard uh regarding like having a place to sleep and just finding uh open lodges until this place was everything fine okay guys <laughs> uh then we're I'm gonna share a little bit about the chola pass after but please kick uh, move move forward so this is a little bit about the pass. The first one is uh, on on the 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 Kongmala Pass, and the second one is a picture on Kalapatar. And if you move forward, Kike, there are the two most awesome pictures for me in the strip. The first one was getting to the Everest Base Camp. Uh, amazing, as I said, we did this on uh, preseason, so we had like the place for ourselves. When we went to the base camp, there was no one. It can get really crowded if you go on a high season. So it was amazing just sit on the top of the rock. And just so you guys know, the Everest is that mountain on the back. On the two pictures is the mountain of the back. That is something really amazing about the Everest guy. Because when you go to the to the Himalayas, trying to, like, my mind was getting to the Everest base camp, seeing the Everest, and that's, this is an amazing mountain. But, guys, it, it is not that amazing to see. Like, there are much, there are many mountains. If you see, like, for example, Oma Dublin, I don't think we put it a photo of Oma Dublin. It's an amazing mountain because it's really thin and really high. And when you're, like, below it, you see, like, this amazing mountain. And when you see the Everest, it's like a really triangular with a really large base. So it doesn't seem as imponent as other mountains on Himalaya. So it is a bit of a, a boomer when you see like the first time that you're going to see the Everest. Oh, my God. And then you see it and you see, uh, maybe the Amada blood is nice. <laughs> uh, maybe you're like, hey, that's the Everest over there. And they are like, nope, that's not the one. The one it's right. That little thingy out there that's right yeah. next to the big thing. That's the Everest. And uh, the second picture, guys, is from the is from the top of Kalapatar, and this is a mountain that if you decide to go to the Everest Base Camp, take a time to go to the Kalapatar, do it at night to see the sunset, or do it right in the morning to see the sunrise. It's an amazing view, and 
Well, once we got to the to the Gorak ship, that is the place that it rests in order to go to the base camp, we decided to do the Kalapatar in the morning. We woke up, did the Kalapatar. When we came back, we were ready to go to... At least I have a, a, a map here just so I can see all the... <laughs> The name of the cities. Okay, you go to Zongla before doing the Chola Pass. And when we were in, in Gorak ship, we started asking everyone if this the city Zongla was going to be open because no one knew if there was a lodge. There was only three lodges on Zongla. No one knew if it was going to be open. We asked like to uh, eight guys, let's put it this way. We asked to eight Sherpas and seven of them said, guys, it's not going to be open. There's no one there. Take the path back to uh, to Nanshi Bazar. You won't be able to do the Chola Pass because it's been like two years and a half that no one did it. So don't do it. There was one guy who said, yeah, yeah, probably it's going to be someone there. And of course, we had the information that we needed and we took it. <laughs> and we decided to go. Uh, and it was supposed to be like a four hours walk into Zongla. And what we thought is, if it, if it doesn't work, if there's no one there, we just come back. But we didn't take in, took in consideration the amount of snow and how hard the trail would be to get there. So it took like around seven hours to get there. And it was a really stressful process because after we walked like five hours, we said, let's go all the way, let's not come back. But when we were almost there, we were thinking, maybe it's going to be too hard to come back. Let's like pray there's someone wet there. And the funny thing about this, this this part of the history is that we got, at the same time that the only owner of a lodge was like arriving in the city. We arrived together with him. We saw, we arrived there, we seated for a minute and thought with ourselves, okay, we are doomed. There's no one here. There's no place to sleep. And then we saw like uh, in the distance, a, a, a person walking in the mountain. And then he went all the way to the city and said that he was a lodge owner amazing we could um uh, stay there for a minute and for a for a night and prepare to do the chola pass and then kike if you go to the next slide this is where the trip got uh hard okay guys so doing the chola pass um it was an insane uh experience because the we were the first uh, the first few guys doing this this hike after the pandemics. So two years and a half, three years without no one doing the trails. There was a lot, a lot, a lot of snow because when you go in the high season, the idea of the high season is that you already have some time of sun and you have the snow to melt a little bit. We were doing it right at the, in the beginning. So there was still a lot of snow. So we were walking with the snow up to our knees and it was supposed to be a track of maybe 10 hours if you get a good pace. We did like in 14 to 15 hours just because it was a lot of snow. And if you see the, the picture on the bottom in the middle, uh, this is a glacier, a big glacier that you have to cross in order to cross the Chola Pass. And the thing is, if you I don't know if you guys know, but on a glacier, you have normally a lot of holes. It's a big rock of ice. And there's a lot of holes on it that it can be like just a small hole or it can be like up to 15, 20 meters depth. And it had so much snow on top of it that we couldn't see anything. We couldn't see where we were stepping. And if we did it on a high season, probably you're going to see a trail. You're going to see like people uh, tracks on it and you're just going to be able to uh, follow the same track. We didn't have this. You have some markers that are like probably 20 meters uh, apart from each other. And it was really stressful doing it, guys. I fell, I kind of fell on a hole. I got to like hang myself in the middle of it. My friend pulled me back. We kept walking. We did the pass. And we had, after the pass, you have to do another glacier in order to get to Gokyohi. And this is the first picture that I shared uh, on, this, on this slide is just, on the second glacier, the trails, they have fallen. When you climb, if you talk to someone who climbed the Everest, he's going to say that you never, even though you do two, three times the Mount Everest, you're never going to do the same mountain. 
because the mountain is alive. You get erosions, you get the wind that moves something. So when we went, there was no trail to get into to Gokyuhi. And we just have to climb like a huge ball of ice that we were not prepared to do. And but we did it. We did it. We got to Gokyuhi. We we were well alive. But after we got to Gokyuhi, we had a big discussion about whether go on with the last pass that was supposed to be even uh, more, I mean, with less structure than this one, or come back to Nanche Bazar, and that's what we chose to do. We came back, so we did two passes and a base camp. We haven't uh, finished the last one. It is a hard decision. For me, it was really hard because I'm really a competitive guy, and, I mean, not finishing it was hard. I got back to Nanche Bazar. It's the two-day walk from Gokyo to Nanche. I mean... Just uh, beating myself up, like, come on, you came all the way to the Everest and you're not going to do the last one. But that's like in the mountain, there's something you see, people say they really have to respect the mountain and it can get really, like, really bad the situation if you don't. So I'm glad we did come back and everything was fine by the end of it. And we came back alive. Well, fine. Since Doc is uh, asking, how did I survive? <laughs> uh, Yanis, we have a, a question here. Uh, Kuku's asking, uh, what was the hardest, the hardest part for you? Uh, and in the other side, in the other hand, as she likes to say, uh, what was the most satisfying moment in that in that trail? Kuku, for me, I know I know it's not the best answer, but truly, the plane for me was the hardest. <laughs> I'm always gonna gonna answer the same this question. If it's not for the plane, it, it was doing the the Chola Pass. It was really really hard on us. But yeah, the plane was off. <laughs> I don't recommend it. The, the plane part. The most satisfying. Th there's something I learned. Uh, I, I'm gonna speak just a little bit about religion and what I found there on Buddhism. But there, when I was in Gokyuri, I exchanged it a, a bit with a guy that owned the lodge. His, their English is not the best sometimes, but he told me something that I'm going to take for, for my whole life. I was uh, beating a little bit myself up about not doing the last pass. And then we started to talk about is not the goal. It's a little bit about the path and how you do it. And this guy, he gave me a, an amazing, amazing insight. And he told me that it doesn't make sense being about the path. I mean, you can choose any path you want on your life. But the true, the truly important thing for him, it's about how you gonna walk on this path, the way you decide to walk. And for him, if you walk uh, with uh, love and cherish and being someone that is gonna help other people and is gonna bring your happiness to the community, it doesn't matter the path that you're gonna choose. It doesn't matter if you go right, left or forward or what you decide to do in your life is much more about how you decide it. And this is something like, it's not exactly about the mountain, but it's something that I think about it every morning. Like it's, it's a mantra for me. It's something that really, 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 it was really amazing, amazing to, to learn. Nice. 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 Janice. Okay. Next up. Yeah. Okay, I, I needed to do a slide about the Sherpas, okay? The people there on the mountains and the Sherpas. The Sherpas are the guys who help you doing the trails, who uh, are guides there. And these people, they are amazing guys. They are in insanely amazing. Uh, the first picture is it's a person carrying up to 40 kilos of food up the mountain. It, th this person, he left me and my friend behind like, we saw him passing by us, and that, that was it. He just went. And the, the nice thing about this picture is that you can't see it, but it's actually a woman that is carrying all this weight and good. So they are, like, sturdy. They are really respectful. They are really nice people, and they are so, so friendly. And they have, like, this resistance that is all of the world. This guy on the right, uh, when I this guy that I spoke about in Gokyo He that told me this about the trip, he saw, I bought this book from him. That is a book about the Sherpa community and just trying to bring a little bit more of recognizing to this kind of, of work that the guys do there. Because if you look to like the most famous Everest climbers, you're gonna find 
Uh, of course, you're going to find the guys who did it first, like Hillary was one of the first guys who did it. And you're going to find uh, some guys from the UK who did it. And, but if he, this guy, this guy is called uh, Hita, Hita Sherpa. They always put Sherpa in the end of the, of, of the name. Uh, but this guy climbed it. He summited the Mount Everest 28 times. And it's like, it's insane. The guys who, who live there, they don't always get the recognition, but they do it in a way that no one is able to do. They're going to bring your oxygen. They're going to bring part of your things. So they're climbing with more weight. They're going to, and they're doing it like it's, like it's something okay to do. But it's insane to climb 28 times the Mount Everest. So I, I, I just wanted to share this slide about Sherpas. And... Yanni, um, I think that this, um, I have two things to, to say about the this, this specific pictures you're sharing. The first one is, um, that you might be not able to to see it, but uh, the Sherpas are actually you told me right. They they're actually tell, uh, having all their weight in their head, not in their in their shoulders. I mean, yeah. it's all grabbed to their heads. So it's they all have a band. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they have a band and they they so both crazy. really. How do you say they it? Did. Yeah, so you can share the weight between the head and the back, but yeah, it's not on the shoulders. Yeah, that's that's way too crazy. Uh, and, and before I move on to the other slide, um, this Sherpa that's in the right of your of your um, windows, guys. Uh, well, windows screen. Sorry, um, it doesn't doesn't it look like uh, a Nepalese uh, La Mosca with those uh, sunglasses? It's kind of weird, right? <laughs> especially, especially for the ones who know La Mosca. It's, a, it's an Argentinian singer that's pretty pretty. <laughs> Uh, weird, but it's, I think it's like that. Okay, I'll shut up. Move on. Yeah, and just to share the, this last slide with you guys about a little bit about religion, just it's something that is really there for for like their lives. And the Buddhism is the predominant religion in in the Himalayas, but it's amazing to see how respectful they are and how uh, part of their lives the religion is. The first picture is just to share with you guys that Everest is the name we gave. Uh, they don't call it Everest. They call it Sangma Mountain. That is a deity, uh, a goddess for them. A lot of the mountains there are seen as gods or goddess. So there's a whole culture about religion that I, I wasn't able to get the whole grasp of it, of course. But it's really, for me, it was really interesting to just to see a little bit about uh, how they they understand the mountain as part of the of, of the religion so it is really a sacred place uh, the one on the top right is awesome it's is awesome to share as well because he had three main things that you're gonna find all the way uh, in the on, in the mountains the first one is a praying flag that is this flags colorful flags with um, with mantras on it. And the idea is that every time the wind blows on the flag, the mantras are going to resonate throughout the mountains. Most of them have Om Mani Padme Hum on it, but there are other mantras that they use as well. And you can find those, those praying wheels. This thing on the right of the picture is just a huge wheel that you can turn. You have to turn with this and you have always to turn to the right. Also with mantras and with the idea of... Uh, moving throughout the mountain once you you make it spin and there are a lot of rocks with mantras on it the thing about the rocks and the the story i want to share is you always it, it need always to be on your right side you have to turn the brain wheel to the right you have to cross the mountain with the with the, the rocks with the mantras to your right side so when i got to go to cheap i saw a guy building a lodge and he was carrying rocks up the hill. It, it was supposed to be like a, a 200 meters uh, walk into the place that he was going to bring the rocks. But the path was with a lot of mantra rocks in the middle. So every time that he would bring like 10 kilos of rocks wearing the band on his head, he would do the path on the right. He would climb like 500 meters more than he should. And then he would come back, leave the rocks, and do this circular path all the way instead of just going straight to the place. So religion is something really present. And 
yeah, the last picture is something that I want to share because for me it was an amazing, uh, amazing thing that happened to me. On the first place that we stopped, they had this monastery, and there are three three types of monastery. Uh, the ones that are lower, they are close to the cities. They are used it to rituals, like someone passed away, or there's some uh, some celebration. This was one of those of those of those monasteries. If you go from five thousand to five to from three thousand to four thousand meters, you're gonna find another monasteries that are more in uh, they used to study. If you go to monasteries that are up to five thousand meters, six thousand meters, normally are the one that monks go to be reclusive. They spend like six months, seven months there. And this one was I saw it. I, Found it was really beautiful but just from the outside it was locked and when i came back to the lodge i was staying i asked the guy if it was going to be open uh on the next day in the morning because i wanted to meditate there a little bit and the guy was the warden of the monastery and he gave me the key he said no if you want to go there to meditate please have the key and i had like this space for myself for the whole night and it was just an, uh, an amazing meditation experience and I know that we are almost on time, but I need to share this with you guys. Since you heard the whole story, I need you guys to be uh, my uh, complices. Help me, Kike. My... Um, yeah, I know what you, what you want to say in Spanish. Complice. Uh, complice, T. My complice. confidence, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, but I, I, need you, I need you guys to help me with this. So on the higher monasteries... Accomplices? There you go, okay. Yanis. Doc, Doc, Doc just said it. Accomplice. That's it. Thank you, Doc. So it, you guys help me with this, okay? If you are a monk and you uh, go to these high monasteries and you are really uh, someone that the community really uh, understands that you are a higher high monk, uh, when you die, they're going to feed you to voters. They feed the monk, the monk uh, meat to voters with the idea of he's going to keep watching through the community uh, and keeping the energy and everything right while he is uh, with the voter or on the voter. I don't know how you guys want to put it. So if any one of you guys see me dying, please help me with it. Okay, make it happen. <laughs> please feed me to a voter. I don't know. I think it's the best idea. I don't want to be below dirt or... Uh, below the, the our barn. No, please feed me to a voter. Okay, help me with this, guys. <laughs> no worries, Janice. We, we we're actually planning to 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 give our body to your lovely dog that uh, we saw in the first picture of the backpack. So it seems like a really aggressive dog. So he he, he or she will actually. Uh, it could work. It could work. Or that. But, yeah, it's a total normal request. Agree on dog. Agree on dog. So. Okay, Yanis uh, and everyone, thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. We are literally on time. So thanks once again for joining everyone here. Uh, thanks, Yanis, for this amazing trip you've shared with us and all your wisdom and information as well. Uh, we hope, guys, that you actually start climbing mountains. Just don't go to Mendoza and just drink wine. At least uh, get 100 meters from sea level or something like that. Uh, yeah, and if you want to do it with a wine, it's okay. Nothing will happen. Um, and, a, and, a, and another tube of oxygen as well. So thanks again, guys, uh, from our side, the ones who produce the other sessions and uh, Yanis as well. Thank you all and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Oh, that's Jan. Now we're going to go with, uh, or we're going to leave with Jan. Thank you, Jan, for the <laughs> music with us as well. We'll play, uh, we'll play something. We'll be using your song. <laughs> <laughs>